Mary, <laughs> please, what's the most important thing that the European Parliament is mm. currently working on? That uh, working on that is really, you think, going to be pivotal to British women. Well, one of the things that we are we are working on, though it has actually gone through as legislation, but we're asking for more monitoring of it, was actually what Justine talked about, um, which in fact was the legislation about equal access to um, to goods and services. Um, as Marina has pointed out, and, and I think you pointed out as well, until this directive, all the legislation that the EU had brought forward uh, about women's rights was to do with women and work and employment issues. The directive about access to goods and services has actually, as a result of the Lisbon Treaty and various other treaties, has actually broken new ground. Um, and I think that's why some of it's not maybe worked out quite so well, because this has been quite a new concept. Um, I know the, the last Labour government actually attempted to introduce a similar measure in this country as national law. Um, and it is quite an, an innovative idea that you have to deliver your services and your goods in a non-discriminatory way. And one of the reasons that insurance has been so much in the spotlight on this is that the insurance industry has some practices which have are very discriminatory indeed. Um, and it's, it's an unfortunate that it's worked out that young women are, in some instances, having to pay more higher premiums for their car insurance. But as somebody pointed out, the other side of this is that as far as pensions go, pensions are now, are now more equal. This is actually because the way the insurance industry works, actuarial tables and lumping people together as groups to pool risk, which is all very well, which is fine actually, which is how insurance works. But I was actually talking in Zurich to representatives from the insurance industry on Monday of this week, and they realised that some of their practices are actually discriminatory, and they are looking very hard now at the way they operate. So I think what this is a very good example of is if you have legislation, quite groundbreaking legislation, at EU level, it then filters down and it actually makes people, companies, large organisations really review how they do things so that their practices and the way that they operate is less discriminatory. And what is the thing that made them aware of that they were discriminating? Well, I think some of us have been pointing it out to them, saying... Successfully, obviously. Well, it, it is having an impact, saying... The way that actuarial tables work in terms of pensions are actually quite unfair. And I, I, being the sort of age I am, I'm becoming quite aware of this. Um, if, if I have, uh, and it doesn't apply to me particularly, because obviously I'm, my pension situation is slightly different, but say there was a woman who had paid in a certain amount to a private pension, the aim of that then, that she would have to buy an annuity, and that annuity would then pay out monthly payments to her in form of a pension. If a man had paid in exactly the same amount, the same annuity over the same amount of time, he would actually get a higher payout every month because the insurance industry uses actuarial tables and they say, rightly as it happens, that men live, don't live as long as women. But that is inherently discriminatory because women are getting less money. So I, the, the insurance industry and the people who run these things need to look at a different way of working these issues out so that they still maintain their pooling of risk, but the outcome is not discriminatory against women. And this message, I think, is getting through to the insurance industry, and they are beginning to review how they, they actually conduct their practices. So that's interesting because then... Am I right in thinking, from what you just said, and the example you just gave, that there are some things where it's extremely obvious that things need to be remedied uh, or changed because of the difference of once the gender equality legislation kicks in, but that there are actually, in French we would say un vestige, there's a remnant of discrimination that is less obvious, in, in the, like in the example you just gave us. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Can Thank I just you. Yes, I do. Yep. Just um, button one button thing that I thought anecdotally brought to life quite how important this stuff is and how recently women were so badly discriminated against. But a lot of people on Mum's Net said they remembered their mothers um, telling them that they had to leave work the moment they got pregnant 
they actually weren't allowed to work um, once they became pregnant. They were asked to leave. And that was as late as the early 1970s. So, you know, without the... So you mean through, that the principle being given of the 1957 the, yeah. directive gradually working its way through about sex discrimination. So um, you're saying that that was the message that was given to the little girl who becomes the woman who then thinks that although that's not obligatory, she is being the product of the message she was given as she was going Well, I, I certainly don't think it was handed down to the little girl in look what the EU did for you that I didn't have. Precisely. But, I mean, um, no, no, but, that's right. but yeah. it's certainly true that there, you know, when you ask what the most important thing that's happened, we, we forget, I think, quite how discriminated against women were quite, until quite recently. I mean, I, I do remember... Um, when, when I, when I'm seeing it's getting a lot of <laughs> <laughs> a lot of reaction. I, I no, I was, I was just saying. I, I do remember when, when I when I left school, um, it was it, it was ex, oh, it was expected actually that women they might work until they had children, but they weren't going to have a career. And a work was kind of fill in for additional money, and then then you you probably wouldn't work, and if you did, it would probably be part time, not for very much money. And I think that's been one of the huge changes I've seen in my lifetime because. Young women who leave school and university now expect to have a career and have a proper job and, you know, and actually work for the rest of their lives and have equal pay, equal treatment, get promoted. I'm not saying that that always works out like that in practice, but that's, that's absolutely accepted that that's what will happen. So that's been a seismic change. Yes. Maria, just before oh, right, I get okay. to you, can I just uh, bring in... Um, Jacqueline, did you specifically want to say something about that? Because I certainly have some questions for you. But if you want to make a point about that, please do. No, I, do, I was just saying, if you were talking about your mother. I can remember my grandmother saying that there were marriage bans. So when you got married, there were certain jobs that you had to leave um, because it was assumed that a married woman would be supported by her husband and had no reason to work. So I think we've come a long way. On the other hand, if you look at uh, the gender pay gap, uh, there is still, on average in Europe, 16% difference in pay between men and women. And in the United Kingdom, it's 20%. So, uh, so we've, we've come a long way, baby. We've still got a long way to go. Yeah.